We're a community group um, committed to environmentalism, human health, and uh, animal health as well. And we're hoping that through this podcast, we can inspire some of you to also become vegan for those same reasons. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Sarah uh, with Vegans of Bozeman. And a little bit about me. I was born in Missoula, Montana, born and raised. Um, Left for college um, in Chicago where I met my husband. We had our children and we spent some years in New Hampshire as well as a couple years in Texas, but um, always wanted to get back to Montana. And so we've been um, living here. Our family's all here now uh, for the past uh, about 10 years. And um, I'm in my late 40s, and um, I am also a preschool teacher here in Bozeman. Um, and I also take care, help take care of my mom. Hmm. All right, my, my name is Kevin um, from the East Coast and uh, grew up in Western Pennsylvania and went to the military, went to college, met my wife, Sarah, and uh, um, right now I work for, uh, work for a delivery company in town, uh, driving around in brown trucks and uh, kind of in the, uh, I don't know, mid, midlife range, right? <laughs> um, and uh, been a vegan for about seven years. Uh, Hi, I'm Lucy. I'm originally from France. I moved to Bozeman to be with my now husband. Um, I don't work. I'm waiting for my green card. So I do uh, animal rights advocacy. And um, yeah, I'm I'm 25. I'm Lenny. I grew up in Helena. And right now I'm a college student in my 20s uh, here in Bozeman. And I work at the university a little bit too. Nice. Yeah, and Lenny and Lucy braved the the elements to get over here today. So yeah, we were like over two feet of snow out there. Too, Lenny so. was a true native Montana and he was like, Oh, it's fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll be there in a couple hours. We'll be there on time. Yeah. We awesome. were there on time, but we were there. Oh, hey, <laughs> close enough. Uh, we were going to start today's program with a little quiz. It's just a two question quiz to get it, all of us thinking. Uh, so uh, the first question is a true False question. Um, so, you know, this times like this, I kind of wish we had a call-in show so we could get immediate feedback from you listeners. But um, for now, we'll just have to settle with uh, wondering what your answers would be. <laughs> uh, but for the first question, true or false, female cows of a certain age automatically produce milk. Again, that's true or false. Female cows of a certain age automatically produce milk. Okay, second question. This one is, um, which animal would you say has the better life? A cow raised to produce dairy or a cow raised to produce beef? So again, which animal would you assume has the better quality of life? A cow raised to produce dairy or a cow raised to produce beef. So if someone would have asked you that question, I don't know, when you were, let's just say, 10, 10 years old, uh, what, what would you say at that time to those questions? Um, when I was 10 years old, I'm sure that I would imagine that a dairy cow for the second question, a dairy cow would have a better life than a cow raised to produce beef. Um, now I think I know better, but we'll get into that. Mm-hmm. And I think that for people who are raised to understand, um, like raised to understand that they think milk is produced for human consumption, it is a product before it is a biological function, it would might make sense that female cows automatically produce milk, but I also know today that that is not true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, myself, same thing. Uh, I think uh, as children were uh, enculturated, I think that might be a good word, or educated, or whatever those words might be, to think that life on the farm is very happy and that uh, cows give milk and, and the farmer's happy and everyone's happy. And yeah, how bad could it be to be a cow? You live out in the pasture, you get to go hang out in the pasture and eat grass all day and just roam around and produce milk for the farmer and his family and his neighbors and his community. 
and uh, be a pretty good life. I would definitely, s- I like that you said enculturation because, you know, I, th- I remember when my children were small, um, how much of, you know, early childhood books, you know, the little cardboard books that they get first or the, the fabric books that they get first are about, you know, the farm animals, the happy farm animals and, um, and what they do for us or like the, the d- decor, the decorations in a, in a baby's nursery. Sometimes they're farm anim- happy farm animals. And, um, you know, even in my classroom, there's always a bunch of farm puzzles, you know. Uh, so, yeah, th- we're definitely given an idea very early on that um, animals on the farm are very happy, that it's a happy place for them to be. Um, and I would say that I think there is implicit and explicit enculturation going on with kids from a very young age about this because um, I work with four-year-olds and five-year-olds and by the time they're four-year-old, they're four years old or five years old, they already definitely have the belief that cows give us milk, that cows job is to make milk for us. Um, In fact, uh, at the school where I teach, one day I walked into the teacher photocopy room and laying there on the counter, a teacher had left a coloring page for the first graders. And it was animals on the farm, animals have jobs. And I remember there being like, you know, the chicken's job is to give us eggs. The sheep's job is to give us wool. Uh, you know, the cow's job is to give us milk. So, you know, that's pretty explicit to be teaching kids that the whole purpose, the whole reason for existence for animals is for what they can give us. You know. Also, it's it makes me think about something interesting. Um, often in conversations, people say, well, it's their job because oh, they they get like shelter and food and they're taken care of, right? And so it's also this idea of like they're willing participants in this job and they benefit equally to this um, implicit agreement. It's seen that way. And that's an interesting thing uh, to it's think almost, about. Yeah, almost like it's like a partnership. Mm-hmm. Like we'll give you food and water and shelter and you give us, you know, your pro- your your products, your secretions, whatever it might be. So, uh, yeah, it's a very anthropocentric view. It's a, it's very much like uh, this kind... It comes from, I think, this idea, which I know has been around for centuries, probably since humans came on the planet, that um, we kind of have taken on this attitude that everything in existence is here for us to do with whatever we want to do with impunity, like there's no necessarily like considering, well, how does this affect the planet or how does this affect the soil or how does this affect, uh, you know, the, the water or the air or the animals or whatever it may be. It, it's just, um, it's like humans have looked around and just thought, well, how can I, how can that profit me? How can that benefit me? Um, and that's like the only point of consideration when making decisions um and it's interesting um that we we really see this uh for example dairy to us especially in western cultures i guess um we see that as an integral part of human life that you eat dairy like it's part of it like it's eternal in a way and that makes it very difficult for us to question if actually it it is that way because it's it's like Mm. a non-question it's just this is the way it's 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 been eternally, and it's the way it should be. Therefore, kind of thing, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely, and I think that right there is the power of culture. Um, it's so normalized <coughs> that no one even questions it, and when someone comes along and does question it, they think you're maybe crazy or mm-hmm. you know you're a troublemaker, those kinds of things. Yet these same people believe in freedom and peace. Well, and we, nonviolence. We do, we do hold those values, and so I think that being open to questioning our culture is something that, you know, is a it's a good value. It's a good practice. It's a good um, habit to have. To actually it's necessary s- for this, actually, right? Yeah. yeah, right. 
which I think brings us to the next point, which is, you know, inevitably in my preschool classroom, um, around the snack table or around the lunch table, uh, a child will say at some point, um, oh, yeah, cows make milk for us. And, you know, much to the chagrin of the children's parents or uh, my school's administration even, you know, I feel like just as an educator, um, I can't just let that statement stand. And so, you know, we, we inevitably will have the conversation um, each school year of, you know, I'll stop them and I'll say, children, you know, why does any mammal produce milk? You know, and it'll take them a while of discussing back and forth. Um, but I'll, I'll say to them, you know, you know, we just learned about bats, you know, or we just read about giraffes or whatever. Um, why, why does any mammal, f- from mice to whales to, you know, bobcats to humans, why does any mammal produce milk? And so eventually I'll have a student speak up and say, oh, I know why, you know, because it's to feed their babies. So, you know, that's not really a debatable, it, you know, we're, now we're kind of getting out of what we've been taught by our culture and we're getting just into kind of a non-debatable scientific fact that mammals only ever produce milk because they just recently delivered a baby and th- their bodies are ready to sustain that baby and give that baby everything that baby needs to grow up. So cows are exactly the same. The only reason why a cow would ever produce milk is because she just recently delivered a calf. So given that fact, when we kind of take that fact and then we kind of superimpose it onto the dairy farm, and this is whether it be a local dairy farm here in the valley or, um, you know, one of the bigger factory farms um, around the, the country or the world. If you think about that, every dairy cow that's, that the farmer is selling their milk, mean, it means that that dairy cow had to become pregnant, had to deliver a baby to start producing that milk. So when that baby is born, of course, the farmer is trying to sustain his livelihood. He's trying to provide for his, himself and his family. So he can't allow the milk to be drank by the baby calf. That's his money. That's the farmer's money. So basically, and this is true on any local family farm all the way up to the biggest farms, uh, the calves are taken from their mothers almost always within the first 24 hours of life. Uh, they, they want to do it as soon as possible because they don't want the mom, the mother, ca- the mother cow, and the baby to bond. Um, and, uh, you know, lots of times when you, there's plenty of footage that you can see on YouTube or other places of farmers taking the calves away, and lots of times, um, you know, the cow will put her body between her baby and the farmer. She'll be trying to stop, and, you know, she'll be crying or mooing or whatever you want to call it, and the, the, as, as the farmer's taking the calf away, the calf is crying for his mother, um, or I think there's one documentary where we watched where, and the farmers knew they were being documented, so they they actually took the mother right after delivery and took her to the milking room and hooked her up and started milking her, and then while she was being milked, they took the baby away, um, and of course as soon as they unhooked her, she ran back to her stall to get back to her baby, and of, of course the baby was gone, and so right. she started looking everywhere for the baby. And you'll hear them; these mother cows will then. Um what's the word kind of like, um, vocalize. Yeah. Clearly uh, distressed. Right. <clears throat> and you have a, we have some friends, right. Who live by a farm over here, right here in the Valley. 
And you can talk about that, but what every time, uh, every time that, that that season rolls around, where they're where these uh, mother cows are having babies and they're removing the calves from them, there's just a whole chorus of these cows um, complaining or yearning for their children. Yeah, day all day, all night, all day, all night. Yep. And the, and the, and our friends made the comment to us, "Oh, we know what." You know, we they're they're hearing these these mother cows um, complaining all night, and they know what time of year it is. So it's just interesting. Yeah, in fact, um, Gary Yurovsky has a very famous uh, video on YouTube. Uh, I think, it, I think whoever posted it on YouTube originally called it like the greatest speech you'll ever hear, or something something along those yeah. lines. So uh, still there if you want to check it out. <laughs> yeah, if you're curious at all about this, um, he talks about this in his video a little bit, and um, I just remember him saying, you know, out of all the farms I've visited in my life, out of all the slaughterhouses I've spent time at, the the most haunting, distressing cr- cries he's heard from animals. Uh, is when uh, mothers are grieving the loss of their their calves because you know whether you want to just call it simple biological instinct or or however you want to think about it you know any mammal who delivers a baby has the instinct to care for and protect and and take care of nurture their 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 young Especially they carry them for, is it nine months as well? Yeah. Like it's really similar to a human uh, pregnancy. So obviously you bond with that um, young while they're in the belly as well, right? I mean, mm-hmm. right. in it's some no ways, thing uh, similar. Yeah, right. for sure. Well, it's, it's also interesting to me when you see the footage of the mother cows, like you said, grieving for their babies when their babies have been separated from them. Um, and same for sheep. I mean, we, we saw we, last week uh, the vegans of Bozeman, two weeks ago, vegans of Bozeman watched a documentary called Peaceable Kingdom. And we'll talk about that a little more later. But um, there were a lot of um, goats. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of uh, animals that were moved from one farm to another, uh, to an animal sanctuary. And there was all this. And a lot of the people who were moving these animals didn't know who the mothers and the babies were. And so... Um, you would see these animals reuniting at the at the at the farm sanctuary, and you saw some some mothers who were still waiting for their children, like they knew who their children were, and that's crazy if you think about that right there. How intelligent these animals are, um, and yet we're using them as a commodity, and it's in some ways it's sad. But I think the one thing I wanted to, the, the whole reason I spoke up here is that when you watch this footage of these animals, these cows, they're so docile. Like, they don't really have a defense, right? I mean, I don't even know if they would bite a farmer. They just run up and it's they try to put their... Extremely gentle, yeah. yeah. they're extremely gentle. They would. They just put their bodies, they, they vocalize. They don't really have any defenses. They're really reliant on humans and other people to help them. And it's just kind of sad to see it. It's, it's, it's very sad. Which is probably why they ended up being so uh, exploited. Um, yeah. I mean, these animals usually are the ones that are not going to fight back, right? Right. It's just easier for the industry. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I love what you said there because I think you're absolutely right. It's no coincidence that we don't try to milk bobcats or grizzly bears or wolves, which are actually indigenous to this area, or maybe even bison. And there's no, it's no, it's not a coincidence that we don't try to harvest milk from the mammals that are actually or deer or whatever. Right. I mean, yeah, these animals actually have been domesticated to be docile, to be peaceful. And if you think about it, all of the animals that are used in animal agriculture, whether it be pigs or chickens or sheep or cows, um, they are the most peaceful animals on the planet. You know, they can't fight back. They can't defend themselves. They can't resist whatever is happening to them. So... Uh, and, and when they try, they learn very quickly. For example, not to do that. For example, like many of these cows, like they, they, they are, I mean, they show how upset they are in the first times that their cows are taken away from them. And then they learn that it's just not going to help. And they stop. Like they still care, but it's like, it's trauma. They, they are not going to even try to run after the cow for anything because they know it's not going to do anything. So they just give up. Um, mm-hmm. 
Um, if this is interesting to you, the listener, um, there's a there's a documentary on. I know it's available on Amazon Prime, um, and it's simply titled "Cow." And what this filmmaker did with without any monologue at all, um, she just followed this one specific dairy cow around for a few years with the farmer's permission. It was just a a, a local. What's her name? Lulu. Was that Lulu? Luna. Luna is Luna. the cow's name, right? Um, so the documentary is just called Cow, and you just you, I think, it's an amazing job of just letting you see life through this cow's eyes, what she experiences, without any explanations of why it's happening or what exactly is going to happen next or anything. You just experience it, almost like how she might be experiencing it. Um, and yeah, you, that re- what you just said, Lucy, reminded me of that because. Um, at one point when they took one of her calves away and she, she cried and she looked everywhere she could. She was frantic. And, um, but then at some point you just see her standing. They're supposed to be eating. All the other cows are standing there eating. And she's standing with the other cows and she just puts her, head, her forehead up against the side of the cow that's next to her. And she just has this, like she has no interest in, you know, she just looks very despondent, basically. Um, like no interest in and eating. She's not eating, right? Yeah. It reminds me actually of Peaceable Kingdom. I mean, many mm-hmm. uh, like another documentary. Yeah, yeah, the one we were talking about earlier. And and these these goats and sheep that were separated from their babies in the industry uh, a couple of times. The sanctuary uh, owners had to kind of train them back into caring their young because they had learned to detach themselves and not bond with them. And and so after like a little while of like pushing the baby to the mother again and again, they were like, okay, so like the baby's staying with me, and 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 they actually learned to care for the cow again, because mm. they they could tell that it was safe to do so. Mm. Um, right. Right. I, I've I've also heard stories of when cows get onto a farm sanctuary, they'll go kind of and they'll hide while they go into labor, and they'll deliver a baby and they'll keep the baby hidden from the farmer uh, and the farmer will finally realize, Oh, she, de- she delivered at some point, like, and they'll go looking for the baby. And uh, because yeah, the, the mom, the mother cow is so worried that they're just going to take away her baby again. Right. So, <coughs> And I don't know if you're going to go back to the process of when you were describing what happens to cows and they, the babies are removed because, you know, a mammal, a cow makes milk or right after they've given birth. And then the calf is separated from the cow, and then that cow is milked for us. But I, I wondered if you're going to get into how they're continually cows are continually impregnated. Definitely, yeah, yeah. We can we could definitely get into discussing our second question: which animal has the better life, a cow raised for dairy or a cow raised for beef? But just to wrap up question one properly. Uh, do, do female cows of a certain age automatically produce milk? Hopefully, we've convinced you that no, they do not automatically produce milk. They produce milk for their babies, just like any other mammal. So, second question. Um, yeah, I think if you would have asked me the question uh, when I was a, I don't know, child or teenager, um, what would you rather be, a cow raised for beef or a cow raised for dairy? I would have been, well, that's easy. <laughs> we all know at some point that uh, beef cows are, are slaughtered and, and you know, used for meat. Uh, but I think a lot of us, ha- as young people especially, have the assumption that dairy cows live out a long, happy, peaceful life. Um, but, yeah, to answer the question more fully, I think it'd be good to just kind of go through the life cycle of a dairy cow. Um, so when, when a, a calf is born on a dairy farm, definitely if, if this is a male calf that's been born, um, a male calf has absolutely no value to a dairy farmer. Uh, they are considered waste products. So uh, male calves are usually killed uh, right, you know, within a few days of birth. Um, 
unless the farmer has some kind of arrangement with a veal production farm. Um, you know, in fact, a lot of people say that the veal industry, the only reason the veal industry is still alive is because um, of the dairy industry. The dairy industry produces a surplus of calves. Um, so unfortunately, even a lot of the female calves that are born have the same fate as the male calves. Um, but the veal industry would not exist if it wasn't for the dairy industry. Which I remember when I found that out, I, that might have been one of the things that took me from being vegetarian to actually considering veganism. Because I, I was like, I'm not eating dead animals uh, anymore, and I feel pretty good about that. But um, yeah, to find out that actually I'm supporting the veal industry by consuming dairy. Yeah, I hear that a lot. A lot of people switch from vegetarian to vegan because of that. Mm -hmm. And we know um, there is a veal farm <coughs> just probably a couple <coughs> couple miles from where we're sitting right now here yeah. in Bozeman. Yeah. Um, it has baby baby calves in little, uh, they almost look like dog kennels out Hunches? in the yard. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Yeah, I remember the first time I, I delivered. I'm a delivery driver. I delivered out there, and uh, it was nighttime. It was winter time, and I stopped the truck. I was getting out to deliver a package, and I heard these noises, you know, moves and things like that. I'm like, what's going on? And n close to the side of the road were these uh, veal, um, like these little, whatever we call them. They almost look like little dog kennels. Yeah, I think they're called hutches. Hutches, but they're really small. Yeah, you know, you got this. Uh, you got this baby cow inside this uh, confined inside these hutches, mm -hmm. which is probably the size of a large dog kennel, maybe a little bigger yeah. than that. So, right, which of course those those calves are killed uh, within a few months of birth. Uh, but the female calves that they do decide um, to keep on um, at the dairy operation are separated from their mothers, of course. Um, and they're just fed a watered-down milk replacer. Um, and one of, the, one of the many heartbreaking things about this is, you know, like any mammal, these calves have such a strong um, sucking reflex. You know, like any no newborn, you know, human or whatever, like they have this insatiable desire to find nourishment through sucking. And so you'll see these little calves like just looking for something <laughs> to latch on to, you know, and they'll, they'll be trying to suck on each other or the farmer's fingers or whatever. Um, I mean, I, I think we did see a documentary where they were pouring the milk replacer into a trough, but then the, the calves actually had like these little rubber nipples that they could access uh, the formula through. So, um, but yeah, these female calves are, um, are weaned off of the milk replacer, at a few months old, and then before they even turn one year old, they start um, injecting these uh, female calves with hormones, basically to force them to ovulate. Uh, so because, again, they're trying to maximize production of milk. So as long as this calf is not ovulating and can't become pregnant and can't deliver a baby, they're never going to get any product or any money out of this calf. So uh, before they're a year old, they will force them to ovulate. And um, as soon as they're ovulating, the calf will be inseminated, usually artificially, uh, which, you know, I mean, I don't think there's any argument. That's, that is not a pleasant process uh, to go through. Even, at, at, you know, standard practices would say that, you know, they do it in a very humane way. But I mean, it, you can you can look at those videos put out by 4-H or lots of different farming um, educational type um, videos and watch it. I mean, I think we would all agree that does not look pleasant. That does not look like anything any of us would want to go It's actually hard to watch. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, as soon as they confirm that this calf has indeed conceived or um, ha is pregnant, of course, it's just a waiting game at that point to um, until she delivers. And again, she delivers the calf. She begins lactating. The calf is taken away almost immediately. 
and then um, the cow is milked. Um, and you know, of course, there's nothing natural about the way that this happens through biological manipulation. Um, the cow is caused to produce about 12 times more milk than they would produce for a calf. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're milk machines, basically. They're, um, they're milked hard, and they're milked several times a day. Um, and because of this constant cycle of artificial insemination, pregnancy, delivery, lactating, being milked very uh, aggressively, most of these dairy cows, um, honestly, they only live between four to six years. Yeah. Um, their bodies just give out. And like speaking as a woman, but I'm sure even you know men can imagine this on some level as well. Like if you're being, if your body is being used to this degree constantly, uh, just cycle after cycle after cycle after cycle. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it makes complete sense to me that your body would just start to give out. Right. Um, and that's the thing. They, they burn these cows out, right? And a, a cow left to like a natural, a natural life would live, what, 20, 30 years old? Right. And yet they're living like, I don't know what you said, four to six, maybe six, seven. Yeah, and then, they're, and then what happens to them? Yeah, so then they're they're sold for cheap beef. Basically. Oh yeah, did we forget to mention like <laughs> the infections and the mas mastitis infection? Exactly. So, yeah. so that's one of the reasons I think their bodies give out is they have, because of the constant aggressive milking through these machines, um, they almost always develop an incredible case of uh, mastitis. Which, you know, this happens to human women as well. Um, where you, you start to have like a infection in the breast, which is very painful. And, um, you know, of course, with humans, it's very easily treatable. I'm sure with cows, it'd be very easily treatable as well. But uh, at some point, it, just, it all comes down to dollars and cents and what is profitable. And if, if you have a surplus of, ca of calves being born, why would you spend the time and money trying to give medical attention or medical care to a sick cow uh, when you really don't have to. Mm. And so it's just easier. It's more economically Sorry. efficient yeah. Yeah, to, to just send her to slaughter. And, and again, you can see innumerable videos of dairy cows who, um, you know, with these enormous udders who can barely walk. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to send them to slaughter and they can't even walk up the ramp to get into the truck to send them to slaughter. Yeah. Um, and then, in fact, I read um, a study this week that said that, um, you know, a large percentage, this, this study said that between 26 to 30 percent of dairy cows that are sent to slaughter are pregnant at the time that they're sent to slaughter. Um, so, so yeah, all in all, um, the more you learn about the, I don't know, the biological manipulation of these animals and um, just this aggressive schedule that they're on. Well, and you, and you said it nicely. You, you said that they're, you know, inseminated, but they're forcefully inseminated over and over into these cycles. I mean... Right. Have burned out. I mean, if that hap would happen to any human, you or know. even to you know, I mean, puppy mills, like rightfully oh. so, like have kind of earned for themselves a, a really negative uh, reputation. I mean, uh, you know, there's plenty of people out there who say you should adopt dogs, you should not shop for dogs because don't support these puppy mills where these these uh, breeding dogs are treated like machines, basically. Well. You know, I I would really hope if if that describes our listener that they would also consider you know not wanting to support dairy any longer because it's it's precisely the same mm -hmm. experience that's done on a much larger scale. Um, yeah, you know what's always funny to me too. I had this conversation with somebody. <clears throat> you know, now there's a lot of plant based milks on the on the market, 
But what's so interesting to me is even like you, you go get a gallon of milk or a half gallon or whatever. I mean, to me, I don't know if our tastes have changed, but even when you open a brand new thing of milk, it still smells like it's already gone bad to me. It already smells like it's souring when I just bought it whenever that was years ago. And I had the conversation with somebody this week and they said they agreed. They're like, yeah, it does smell sour. And you have to think about that. We, we, we don't have time to probably or know all the ins and outs from when the cow's milk to when it gets to market. But it's just interesting to me. Um, it's a very perishable product, which is just one more little reason to be like, is this really a necessary product for us to continue to support? Or subsidize. Well, or and, th- and that is a question. I know we talk about, we've been talking about the, the animal welfare side of this argument. And there is a human cost as well to drinking dairy. And that might be a whole nother show. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> I think it's worth mentioning, you know, some of the things, you know, to tease another show at some point. You know, the majority of humans in the world are lactose intolerant. And it's interesting when you're a, a newborn baby, your body creates this enzyme called lactase that allows you to uh, process your mother's milk. But usually you lose that enzyme when you turn about four years old. And it's just interesting that we're continuing as humans. And by the way, humans are the only species that drinks another species milk. No other species does that. We we call someone crazy if they would consider to drink another species milk, like, for example, giraffes or elephants. Like, why would you even consider that? Well... It's well, yeah. a little arbitrary, isn't it? Well, and, and the thing is, places in big cities where they have a lot of rats, I just don't understand why they're not milking rats for milk, you know. Huge loss. Huge loss. <laughs> 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 but but so many humans are lactose intolerant. And just a funny story, one of our family members uh, decided he was going to go vegan for 30 days. So he did that. And he when he went back <laughs> after he developed lactose intolerance. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So it's just funny to me. Like it, um, many and many Native Americans, uh, many African Americans are very lactose intolerant. Yeah, it's mostly just Western Europeans that have kind of developed. A- right. But even with them, if they stop drinking it, they start to develop yeah. a lactose intolerance. So it's the whole enzyme of your body changes. But what's interesting, and this is something to get into at some point, um, that the U.S. government and government agencies are still promoting um, healthy dairy products, you know, healthy in air quotes, to these communities, to African-American communities, to Native American communities, and yet they are biologically incapable of processing this. So, and then there's all the studies about how it actually is really bad for even people who can digest it. Right. So we, I, th- I think we will need a, a show. Yeah, we absolutely. Because yeah, the other thing is osteoporosis. Show. Absolutely. There's a lot more to say about dairy. Yeah, a, lot of the, a lot of even the health benefits that come from milk, a lot of that is because of how it's fortified, which obviously you don't have to consume a cow's milk to consume mm. a fortified product. Interesting. So it's not even naturally there. And that's right. not all of it. Right. It's not the entire health thing. Right. That's and a pretty big portion of it that is often left out of discussion. That's a great point. Totally. And I know, and I just want to say this too, even the concept of osteoporosis, um, the United States is one of the largest consumers of milk, and we also suffer from the highest rates of osteoporosis. Um, and so you have to wonder, and some doctors, some plant-based doctors are starting to argue that actually Drinking cow's milk is one of the leading causes, What is one of the triggers, a uh, catalyst for osteoporosis. And it's interesting, too, uh, Dr. Milton Mills, an African-American doctor, plant-based, um, he made the point in a, in a video, he was speaking to, the, I think, the USDA uh, board, and he said something to the effect that African-American women are genetically um, protected from osteoporosis, but when they drink cow's milk, they kind of lose that ability. And yet the government is pushing cow's milk to them. So it's just an interesting thing. And that, uh, yeah, and just we, we, I mean, when you look at the ingredient li- list, it just reminds me of the soy milk uh, um, conversation that people have, like being concerned about the hormones and the estrogen in right. soy milk, right? And doctors, when you ask them this question, like nutritionists, and such, right? Like, the thing is that the hormones you find in milk, the estrogen you find in milk is actually the hormones that are, much much stronger than the. <laughs> well, I, th- I, th- I think I think in general though, I think it's right. it is true that um, yeah. cow's milk, the estrogen is is a is an animal estrogen, yeah. whereas soy milk, it's a it's a it's a plant it's a plant estrogen. It's called yeah. phytoestrogen. So 
we'll it's have just, to look into the yeah, studies. Yeah, look into it. But uh, uh, but I th- I also find yeah. it fascinating that um, you know the whole point of cow's milk from a cow, mother cow is to grow this this hundred mm-hmm. pound animal into I don't know a thousand pound animal in a short period of time. So um, plant estrogen doesn't quite and, do that. Yeah, and the vaccines that are given to cows, the medications, the hormones, etc., just to keep them keep them alive mm-hmm. and relatively healthy, right. right? It's also something to consider. Absolutely. So maybe just to wrap up uh, our little quiz time and our quiz uh, conversation, uh, the second question, which animal has a better life, the dairy cow or the beef cow? Um, I know Kevin was watching a, a YouTube video maybe yesterday about this, and I think she, was it Dairy is Scary? Dairy is Scary. It's a short little video on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you're interested, check that out. But I think she ended that video very, very well just by saying, well, yeah, we all know that beef cows are killed for beef, but a dairy cow is biologically exploited and emotion, you know, emotionally abused and um, you know, just goes through these cycles of these endless cycles of exploitation. And then she's killed for beef. So I think, I think, I hope, once again, I hope that maybe we've at least caused you to uh, begin to question the idea that um, dairy cows' lives are certainly not any better than the life of, of beef cows. And also, you have any comments for us, you can send it to our email address at vegansabozeman at gmail.com. We're also on Instagram, uh, I believe Facebook as well. Yep. And, uh, and YouTube, if you want to watch the replay, we'll be on YouTube. On YouTube. Bozeman, yep. And you are listening to KGVM Bozeman. This is the Vegans of Bozeman radio show. Yeah, we'd like to talk a little bit more about what Vegans of Bozeman does. If you want to check us out, um, you can especially check us out on Facebook. We have monthly potlucks. We have monthly documentary screenings. And uh, we'll talk about these more in other shows. All free to the public. Absolutely. Yep. All are welcomed. Yeah, and feel free to send us any feedback, questions, uh, and we might address, I mean, respond to them on the show. For sure. Yeah, I would love to do that. I would, I would definitely love to feel like this is a open conversation with the Gallatin Valley, with Bozeman, um, and that we're having just a free and open conversation, going back and forth, sharing ideas. Um, we, d- we definitely would love to, to get your feedback. And uh, we'd love to talk about fromage now. Yeah. <laughs> Fomage, what's that? Oh uh, well, I mean, fomage. It's a uh, it's a local, um, I guess. Bozeman based, yeah. Bozeman based food business. Um, this woman, Peg Schaefer, she uh, she creates uh, vegan cheeses. They're pretty amazing. I think she's uh, by occupation, she's a chef, and um, I don't know her whole story. I think we'd like to get her on the show and talk to her. Um, but she, you can find her at the farmers market in the summer and also the winter farmers market. But um, Fomage, she makes some amazing, amazing cheeses. I mean, they, they taste legit, all kinds. Aren't her products also available in the mall? They were. At... I was there recently, and I didn't see any, so I'm oh, not gotcha. sure. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I need to check For a while, they were available at that 406, that 406 Marketplace, yeah. Little store. I didn't see that So, recently. but definitely at um, the winter and the summer farmer's, farmer's market. markets. And she also makes other th- plant-based things. Um, she makes this Parmesan cheese, which is made out of, I think, sun- sunflowers maybe. Uh, we use it quite often. Um, she started making vegan donuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't go wrong with that, right? And yeah, she and also does uh, crackers to go along with the cheese. Oh, those crackers are amazing. They really are. They and are she, the reason uh, on her website, you can see the reason uh, she she actually went and started this business is that when she became vegan, she didn't like any of the vegan cheeses out there. And that's the hardest thing. That I mean, it was the hardest thing for her when she went vegan. So she decided to... Going to that, which we're very grateful. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it's just the great. variety of cheeses she can make is pretty amazing. She makes a brie, she makes a Swiss, she makes everything. You, you, you think of it, she can make it, and she and does make yeah, it. Yeah, and she, she gets her ingredients from uh, local family-owned farms and uh, the food co-ops. Mm. Um, so that's really cool as well. Yeah, she's really nice. <laughs> she really is. I mean, the food's amazing. The donuts, I haven't tried them yet. I keep seeing them on uh, Instagram. And Have you had any? Uh, I had a little, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's started to make uh, way more different kinds as well. Yeah. Mm. It's very exciting. Yeah, they're awesome. Right. And also, yeah, I think she makes some bakers as well. But anyway, um, but Fomage, she is sponsoring Earth Day 
Yeah, we ha- we're going to have a Vegan Earth Day um, March event. It's not really, I mean, it's going to be a small march. Anyways, you can check that out on our Facebook group and uh, Facebook page. We also have a page. You can have all the information there. We'll talk about it a little bit more in the future. And yeah, she gracefully agreed to give us some free food to give out to people. Awesome. Some, yeah, Yay. some cheese. Very nice. Cheese. That'll be a fun way to sample her wares. Absolutely. And just if if anybody out there is wondering about the the name of her brand, so fromage, I guess is kind of a play on the French word. Do you want us? Do you want to talk about yeah. it? Let's ask our French expert. You know, <laughs> why? Why am I talking about it? It, it is. is talking about it. Uh, it means uh, f- fake. <laughs> it doesn't sound good in English. <laughs> but yeah, f- fromage is cheese in French. And so that's a plan word, obviously. And yeah. uh, if you wonder how it's written, it's F-A-U-X-M-A-G-E-S. Yeah. Fromage. Fromage. Yeah. And uh, her website, fromage.com. Nice. <laughs> a little advertisement there. <laughs> We're not sponsored by yeah. her. <laughs> no. That. Well, yeah, yeah we, we do want our... Our radio show to be Bozeman specific or Gallatin Valley specific, uh, and so it, it is fun to highlight um, like what's going on around here. So, yeah, and we should also mention, right? I mean, big news: pharmacy just opened up again mm-hmm. last weekend. Yeah. Right? Oh yes, <laughs> pharmacy is open on. Uh, why can't I think all of a sudden? Right across from the high school. Right across from the yeah. high school. Wow. Is that awesome. it's Main Street right there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was there on their opening day and it was so wonderful to be back. It just felt good. And of course, it was beautiful and delicious. Yeah. Uh, everything there is vegan. I forgot to mention the next potluck's date and location. Mm. Uh, so it will be April 2nd. The potluck will be um, at 12 30 and the documentary screening. We'll be at 2 p.m. and we'll screen this time punk rock vegan movie by Moby. Oh, yeah. It's, gonna, it's very exciting. That's a great movie. <laughs> um, and by the way, yeah. we should mention that's a vegan potluck. <laughs> yes, it's a vegan potluck. So bring vegan food. Uh, <coughs> we we obviously are very happy for anyone to show. Um, be awesome. Yes. And then we'll be at the at 120 South uh, Grand Avenue. 120 uh, South Grand. Yeah, Grand Avenue. Yeah, it's the piece of Christ Community Church in the basement. Yeah. They've graciously allowed us to uh, occupy their space. I'm very grateful about that. Yes. And so what we also do there, every once in a while, is we have a screening of a documentary. And like uh, Lucy said, it's going to be uh, Moby's new uh, documentary called The Vegan Punk Rock Movie. Yeah. But last time, last mm-hmm. month, we screened a documentary called Peaceable Kingdom. It's really interesting uh, was talking about uh, we, were ta- we were talking a little bit about about a farm sanctuary, but it has roots in Montana, and um, I thought it was really awesome. Um, some of you may be aware of a, a rancher; his name was Howard Lyman, and uh, I think he's he's written a book called Mad Cowboy, but he's from Montana. He he probably I think by his own admission had had run one of the largest feedlots in the state of Montana, and now he's a uh, he's an all out vegan and. Yeah. Uh, He's an activist now. Actually. He's an activist, yeah. correct. And he went to MSU, <laughs> yeah. which is fun. Strong, strong connections to Bozeman. But uh, let's talk about that documentary for a little bit. I mean, that was it was a pretty amazing story. I mean, I I did love that. I loved how I love the, you know, I've I've seen obviously a lot of vegan documentaries, but what made this one special to me uh, was you. Re- I felt like you really got to know. Um, the farmers that are highlighted in this film. Um, There's one couple that runs a sanctuary and then um, a few other people who kind of highlights their journey um, who are raised on farms and um, eventually went vegan. You really get to know them as well as the animals that they they have in their care. Um, So it just, it felt a lot more intimate to me than a lot of other vegan movies that are also wonderful in their own right. But uh, I really enjoyed the intimacy of Peaceable Kingdom. Yeah, it's Peaceable Kingdom, The Journey Home. And you can find it online for free. Uh, Peaceable Kingdom uh, dot, uh, no, peaceablekingdomfilm.org, I believe is the... Yeah. Yeah. And what was interesting about it, I think everyone in this particular film, the people featured, they were all farmers or ranchers. 
mm-hmm. and now they're they're vegans. Yeah. And I, you know, I was just thinking with our dairy conversation today, like one one of the couples, the married couples, I guess, who were highlighted in Peaceable Kingdom um, was just this man and woman who just loved goats. They loved having goats. And um, they got to the point where it was like, well, we can't really afford this unless we turn this into a goat milk operation. We could sell the milk, and, and that's how we can support this hobby of ours of collecting goats. Uh, but it turned into exactly what we were describing with dairy cow um, production, which is you know, having to impregnate the goats. Uh, they deliver. You have to take the goats away from the mothers so that you can get the milk. Uh, the, male ca- the male goats are sent off to slaughter. Uh, and this couple just talked about how they kept doing it, but their consciences just wouldn't let them rest. They, it, it started bothering them more and more and more. Like, it's, is, this really, is this really how it has to be? Um, do we really want to be doing this over and over and over again? Um, and so eventually they, they stopped operations. I think a lot of their goats went to a sanctuary. And um, so they, you know, they found their way through. Where, what, so that's what I like about this documentary is it, it shows how these people growing up on farms, especially, we, we accept the culture that this is normal, that we don't need to care about these animals, that we shouldn't care about these animals and what they're going through. Um, And we're able to harden ourselves in a certain way to not feel bad about it. But, you know, even, even the people in the business, they, you know, it's still possible for them to open up. Yeah. Yeah. Like reverse that enculturation and like, to come back to their childlike state of actually caring mm. about animals again. Well, I think there was a scene in there too, right? Where the common thing on the county fair, you have these kids who go through 4-H and they bond with this animal. And then I think after they've won their blue ribbon and, you know, all these animals are whatever competed for their show or whatever, whatever that process is, then they, somebody buys them right at the county fair and the, 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 the teenager child is separated from this animal that they have bonded with right there and 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 somehow it's part of growing up on the farm that you just kind of have to accept that and yet you could see so many of these teenagers just really unhappy uh sad that they're being separated from this animal so it's almost like yeah you almost have to um be in you have to insensi- desensitize yourself so yeah. to speak it's like a learned prejudice or something that which is just a fascinating like thing to observe, you know, that we do that to our kids. Probably, I've heard people say like the first prejudice that children are taught is the prejudice to not care about animals, at least not certain animals, you know. The documentary coming up, um, punk rock vegan movie. Let's we'll maybe just talk about that real quick. I think one of the things that I thought was interesting is. Um, you know, I grew up in the 80s listening to this kind of music, and I listened to a lot of the bands I think that are featured in this, but I had no idea that many of them were vegetarians and vegans. And it was almost like a, like when we did, now we use the term punk rock, <laughs> we want to say something's like badass and cool, but um, wow, they were being rebels back then by being vegetarian and vegans. And I like, had no idea right. that there was a connection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel. Um, Super surprised. I haven't seen this documentary yet. I'm very excited to see it. And again, it's it's produced by Moby. Um, so, but I do know one thing I've always known since I was a teenager is that um, yeah, people in the subculture of punk rock, they are all about questioning culture, uh, definitely questioning authority, questioning what we've been taught, um, and so you know, this fits right in with that, that, um, some, and I'm trying to remember the phrase that Moby, uh, describes them or, or their culture that they, do you remember straight edge or something? Oh, straight edge. Yeah. Which I think meant for them just living a very, like aligned with their values and, um, even being sober, being vegan, 
So, yeah, I'm very excited to see this uh, punk rock vegan movie. It's going to be a nice uh, little nuance on the hippie vegan, right? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we invented that stuff, man. <laughs> As old timers. All right. Well, um, thank you for listening to the Vegans of Bozeman radio show on KGVM. And again, if you have any feedback for us, you can always catch us on uh Email us at uh, veganzofbozeman at gmail.com. You can reach out on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, any of those venues.